Get this, an 83-year-old woman loses her entire life savings. Oh, wow. Yeah, we're talking merely $50,000. Oh, my God. All because someone spun a, a convincing story over the phone. Mm -hmm. This isn't just another news item, this is personal. Right. We're diving deep into the anatomy of a heartbreaking scam, mm -hmm. figuring out how it works, and uh, more importantly, how you can avoid falling prey to something similar. Our source material is um, a news article mm -hmm. detailing the experience of Lois, okay. who believes she was helping her grandson in a crisis. Mm -hmm. Spoiler alert, it was all a cruel lie. So buckle up, because we're about to break down this scammer's playbook right. step by sinister step. Yeah. It all started, as these things often do, with a phone call. Mm -hmm. Lois gets a call on a Friday night, and on the other end, is a voice she thought belonged to her grandson. Okay. Completely distraught, right. claiming he'd been arrested. Oh. Oh. What's insidious is that these scammers are masters of tapping into our deepest fears. Mm -hmm. It's not just about mimicking a voice. They weave a narrative designed to trigger an emotional response. Right. They'll often say they were in an accident, maybe even cause some harm. This evokes instant panic. Yeah. Or of a desire to protect. And that's precisely when our rational thinking starts to fade. And that fear is like rocket fuel for this whole scam. The grandson went on to say he was driving under the influence. Oh my God. Went the wrong way down a one-way street and hit another car. Oh. But it gets worse. Okay. He specifically begs Lois to keep this whole mess a secret. Oh gosh. Not even telling the rest of the family. Ugh, the classic isolation tactic. Yeah. You see, these scammers know that if victims confide in someone, they're far more likely to get the support they need to see through the deception. Right. So they weave this narrative of urgency and secrecy, mm -hmm. cutting off their victim from any potential lifelines. Sadly, it worked like a charm. Wow. Lois, fueled by panic and that fierce love we have for our family, agreed to pay her supposed grandson's $9,500 bail. Mm -hmm. But here's where it takes a turn that many wouldn't expect. The scammer tells her, that, and I can't believe I'm saying this out loud, the court has a special arrangement for bail payments using Coinstar. This is where things get really interesting. Right. They're banking on most people being unfamiliar with how cryptocurrency actually works. Right. They hear a familiar name like Coinstar. Right. And it lulls them into a false sense of security. It's right. all about manipulating perceptions. Okay, so for those of us who might only use Coinstar for spare change, can you break down what's really going on here? Absolutely. Cryptocurrency, in the simplest terms, is like digital cash. Mm -hmm. But here's the kicker. Once it's sent, it's virtually untraceable and irreversible. Right. Much like handing someone a wad of bills. This makes it incredibly appealing to scammers. Yeah. They can receive large sums of money with very little risk of being caught. So Coinstar, which is generally used to turn physical cash into digital currency, right. becomes this unwitting middleman. Precisely. And the scammer exploits this by walking Lois through the entire process. Exactly. The scammer is basically coaching Lois remotely. It's awful. Uh, turning her into an unwitting accomplice in her own fleecing. Lois, completely oblivious to all of this, heads to her bank, withdraws thousands in cash, Ah. Imagine the scene at the bank, someone trying to explain this to a teller. Oh, uh, yeah. Then goes to a Coinstar machine. This is where my stomach just drops thinking about it. I mean, the article mentions, Lois, feeding $100 bills into that machine one by one. How long could that have taken even? It could take hours, and that's part of the scammer's plan. They'll often keep the victim on the phone the entire time, claiming it needs to be done quickly to expedite the process or some other fabricated reason. This constant pressure and guidance are designed to prevent the victim from stopping to think, to question, or worse, to ask for help. And it gets worse, right? The article mentions that people did try to intervene. Bank managers questioned the large withdrawal. Even a stranger at the store, seeing Lois struggling with the Coinstar machine for over an hour, asked if she was sure about this. I mean, someone even tried to warn her directly. This is a classic example of how these scams prey on a potent mix of emotions. Hmm. Lois, at this point, is not only terrified for her grandson, but she's also likely experiencing a kind of tunnel vision, laser focused on saving him. Yeah. Any doubt, any warning is just going to get brushed aside because it doesn't fit the narrative she's been fed. It's heartbreaking because it feels so avoidable from the outside. But when you're in that emotional pressure cooker, it's easy to see how someone could fall for this. Exactly. And just when you think it can't get any crueler, the scammer calls back the next day. This time they've upped the ante, claiming the prosecutor has added more charges, increased the bail, 
And to twist that knife even further, they say the woman her grandson hit suffered a miscarriage. Oh, that's just low. They're piling on guilt and desperation, playing her like a fiddle. Exactly. This escalation is a key part of the scam. It's about keeping the victim off balance, making each demand seem believable within the context of this ever-worsening situation. So Lois believing she's doing everything she can to help her grandson goes back to that Coinstar machine, this time depositing another $15,000. It's almost unfathomable. It's tragic. And the nightmare doesn't end there. The scammer calls a third time, demanding an additional $25,000 for attorney's fees and court costs. At this point, they've completely drained her life savings. This is where I have to ask. What about Coinstar and Coime, the cryptocurrency exchange involved? Surely there are safeguards in place to prevent this kind of exploitation. This is where things get complicated. The article does mention that Coinstar machines display warnings about potential scams. But remember, Lois is acting under immense emotional duress, laser focused on saving her grandson. It's a classic case of too little too late, right? I mean, the, the warning is there, but for someone in Lois's position, it's practically invisible. Exactly. And to be fair to these companies, they're walking a tightrope. They want to protect their customers, but they also you know, don't want to seem like they're uh, intruding on legitimate transactions. Mm -hmm. The article does mention that Coinstar issued an apology to Lois, highlighting the irreversible nature of these transactions. And CoinMe stated that they closed the scammer's account and emphasized their commitment to customer protection. I mean, it's a start, right? But it feels a bit like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. What I'm grappling with here is, where does the responsibility lie? It's easy to say Coinstar or CoinMe should do more, but how do you stop something like this without turning every transaction into an interrogation, you know? It's a thorny issue, no doubt. There's a growing conversation about potentially um, implementing waiting periods okay. for large cryptocurrency transactions, right. especially those initiated by individuals who might be more susceptible to scams. But it's a delicate balancing act, right, between security and convenience. Right, because the beauty and the curse of cryptocurrency is this anonymity, isn't it? It's a double-edged sword. But for people like Lois, it's the Wild West out there. It's terrifying. So what can we actually do? I mean, apart from becoming cryptocurrency experts overnight. Well, knowledge is power, right? Right. And the first step is awareness. Talk to your family. Yeah. Especially older relatives who might be targeted. Um, the article mentions Lois suggesting families have a secret password. Oh, interesting. Or phrase. Something unique they can use to verify each other's identities in situations like this. It's like that old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love that idea of a family password. It's simple, but it can make all the difference. Absolutely. Yeah. And beyond that, just encourage your loved ones to be wary of, you know, any unsolicited requests for money, especially if they come with a side of urgency or pressure. Remind them that it's okay to hang up the phone, to say, I need to think about this or to reach out to someone they trust for a second opinion. Basically, if something feels off, trust your gut. Yeah. Don't be afraid to hit the brakes and ask for help because once that cryptocurrency is gone, it's like chasing a ghost. Exactly. Mm. And remember, if you or someone you know has fallen victim to a scam, you're not alone. There are resources available to help and reporting these incidents can help prevent others from falling prey to these criminals. Couldn't agree more. This has been a heavy one, but so important. We started with Lois's story, but this isn't just about one woman's experience. It's a stark reminder that in the age of digital transactions and increasingly sophisticated scams, we all need to be vigilant. So if you've listened this far, do yourself a favor, share this episode with someone you care about, start a conversation, because the best defense against these predators is a well-informed and empowered public. Thank you for joining us for this deep dive. Remember to subscribe to our channel for more thought-provoking discussions. And as always, stay curious, stay informed, and stay safe.